Well, first of all, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the, the sovereign people of this land, the Gadigal people, uh, and um, also the, the Gadigal ancestors that guide and protect us in, in our discussions today. I'd also all like to thank AHO for creating the space to, to have discussions around housing. Um, today, uh, as I mentioned uh, at, at the previous uh, panel, um, I've come to realise or, or it dawned on me that um, uh, a lot of uh, us blackfellas in the room uh, have come from, uh, come through uh, community housing or Aboriginal housing. Uh, we, we didn't, we weren't really privileged enough to come from private ownership in our, in our generation. Um, in terms of my experience, I guess, uh, first of all, I, I'm, I'm not from this country. I'm from far north Queensland. Uh, my, my people are the Wudgetee, uh, the Manta Ray Dreaming, and I also have connections to um, the lower western parts of the Torres Straits uh, around Marby Org and, and the islands around there. Um, I've been with New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council for nine years. Uh, uh, I'm relatively new to the position that I'm in at the moment, but I spent uh, a good portion of my nine years in the in a regional office back in, I always say Queen and we're in Canberra now because <laughs> the rents are lower, um, believe it or not. Uh, and during that period, I, I, I guess, worked with the 34 land councils in our zone jurisdiction, uh, observing and, and trying to provide guidance around the, uh, I guess, the day-to-day -day challenges of keeping the doors open as a local Aboriginal land council. Uh, and, and one of those challenges, uh, particularly for 33 of the 34 land councils, is trying to manage lalk housing. Now, we talk about lalk housing, we've, we've moved away from describing it as social housing. Part of the reason why is that um, under one of the more recent amendments in 2012, the, the term social housing was removed from the Land Rights Act. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's out of sight, out, out of mind. That, that didn't make all the houses go away. Um, Lalks still deal with, with Lalk housing. Uh, as a bit of trivia, my, my first foray into, into Aboriginal, uh, uh, I guess, business was um, through my parents when they were also grappling with trying to find uh, rental accommodation in, in back in uh, a place called Gordonville, which is south of Cairns, where I grew up. Um, and back in those days, and it's probably still the same now, um, that um, private renters didn't want to rent to Aboriginal people. So uh, mum and dad and a f few of the icons back up that way back in the day, like Mick Mickey Miller, um, established the first Aboriginal housing co-op in, in Cairns called Woomper and Moorelag. Uh, and that's, to my understanding, still, still going strong after probably 40 years in, 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 in existence. And observing how Wumpera and Mooralag, um did business with the Aboriginal tenancies um, demonstrated to me uh, why there's a necessity or, or blackfellas, working with blackfellas around housing tenancy is, is a lot more effective, but um, we don't have enough blackfellas working that, that can work with, 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 um, with, with Aboriginal tenants. Uh, so from a, from a land rights perspective, I'm, I'm not an expert. The experts are basically sitting in the room uh, and, and they're the LALC, LALC CEOs that have to deal with, with LALC housing. Uh, and so my observations are observations. Uh, and whilst Newswalk are starting to venture into the, into the realm of, of housing, uh, housing affordability, uh, we are um, not so much relatively new to it, but we understand that there's been um, market failures in providing adequate uh, housing for Aboriginal people. Um, and given those market failures, uh, land councils, Aboriginal housing providers um, have been in you know, services of last resort, but, but developed out of necessity as well. Uh, so I guess the first, and, and I've only got one slide, uh, just, to, just to paint a picture of where Lalk housing is at at the moment. Um, 
as you can see, I haven't called it social housing, I've called it community housing. Um, so, so in the New South Wales Land Rights Network, there's um, 2,614 houses in, in land council ownership and uh, approximately 961 of those is, is, are located on former missions and reserves. So this is a bit more of a technical matter on, on the Land Rights Act. 14 LALCs uh, have been approved to provide uh, Section 52B uh, social housing scheme. So that was when social housing was in, actually in the, in the Land Rights Act. There was a, there was a term for it. But as I mentioned, that, that um, section has been removed. But those approvals still, still prevail, um, or endure rather. Um, now since, uh, since the amendments to the Land Rights Act, uh, a further 23 land councils have been approved on, under, our, under, under Newswalks policy to manage uh, housing in, in, a, in a certain way. Oh, sorry, under... <laughs> I should have read, read my own um, slides. <laughs> 23 LALCs approved as Aboriginal community housing providers under the Aboriginal Housing Office Building Growth Strategy. So that basically they're 23 head leases. So land councils have head leased their housing stock to AHO and AHO have, have subleased them to a housing management provider. Uh, 39 head leases between LALCs and, and the AH, AHO. And uh, 13 million uh, spent on water and sewage program on, in the 61 communities. So, so water and sewage has a bit of background. Uh, out of the 60, in the 61 discrete communities, uh, one of the major issues that land councils face is, is that cost burden around not only providing the housing but also providing the infrastructure such as roads, poles and wires, so forth and so on, uh, water, so forth and so on, to those houses. In, back in 83, when, when those uh, discrete communities were transferred to, to land council ownership, they were basically transferred in, in a state of disrepair. And since 83, land councils have struggled to meet the costs of not only housing, but of that infrastructure as well. Uh, and one of the responses uh, more recently in 2009 was for uh, the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council and State Government to um, provide funding to address uh, a certain level or a certain degree uh, of the, of the difficulties in terms of water and sewage on, on those discrete communities. You know, we, we can take a philosophical argument that it, it shouldn't have been Newswalk's responsibility, uh, that's, that should be uh, Aboriginal people's rights as citizens of this country, but we realise that that, that wasn't, that, that, that wasn't going to solve the problem and, and we haven't you know, solved it to any great degree. Now the other component is three million spent on subdivision uh, and the subdivision is around, if those of you that in the room that, uh, that don't have a history with, with the discrete communities, is that land council housing on discrete communities is generally all built on one lot. When you look out the cadastral maps, so forth and so on, you'll just see one lot and that's where all the houses are built. And therefore, um, to be able to... For, for land councils to be able to uh, look out um, those cost issues around rates, uh, water charges, so forth and so on, it's very difficult to, to um, articulate that or extrapolate that out because of that one lot issue. So what Newswalk looked out was uh, in partnership with the federal government was contributing uh, six million all up uh, th three million from Newswalk, three million from the federal government, on a subdivision project where we approached land councils to determine whether or not um, they, they wanted to look out subdividing up that one lot of land, so people had their own 
uh, particular lots. Uh, and, and, the, and the back story to all that as well was that the federal government at the, at the time also saw subdivision as, as a pathway to home ownership uh, and home ownership as a pathway to wealth generation. Um, uh, to date, we've had four LELs that have approved DAs. Uh, un, under the Land Rights Act, you, you require a, a member's decision to go to DA in the first place. Uh, four LELs have, have agreed on that. Uh, and two subdivision, two more subdivision plans are, are in waiting. We're halfway through that process because of, because of there were uh, state planning issues um, with the subdivision project. Uh, and the response by state government has been to develop what, what they call a solution brokerage uh, process where we look at how we unpick the state planning issues. So what does all that mean? Well, that, that just provides a background to Lauk housing. And when you look at Lauk housing and you look at uh, uh, Lauk's functions, uh, generally you'll, you won't find Lauk housing in those functions. You know, if you, if you opened up your Land Rights Act, you'd, you'd see that LALC housing, uh, LALC functions are related to land acquisition, land management, culture and heritage, uh, financial stewardship, uh, and decisions around um, corporation. So housing, in some ways, people can see as an extra burden. And with the backdrop of um, the Australian government back in 2002-2003 looking out winding back services to Aboriginal communities uh, and particularly in the regional areas uh, and in major city areas saying to, to blackfellas, well, um, instead of accessing Aboriginal specific services, we want you to um, access mainstream services because you're no different to, to the rest of the population. Well, land councils have had to endure, and they've had to endure in, in the sense that they've, they've gotten by. Um, unfortunately, because of that wind back of, 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 of services, particularly in the uh, regional and remote communities, land councils are generally, you know, in a lot of those situations, the last Aboriginal shop front in the community. And what that means is that it's not only about pushing forward on those core functions around land claims, land management, looking after your members. It's about looking after your tenants in, in your local housing as well, in, in, your, in your local housing. And through the difficulties, through the challenges, there, there's always good news stories. Every land council that, that I know from, from my time in the Southern Zone has got a good news story about how people manage houses, how people manage uh, service tenants, um, and, and how we keep blackfellas on, you know, in shelter, keep a roof over people's heads. Mm -hmm. And the one, uh, you know, uh, one key factor behind that is this connection to culture, connection to community, mm -hmm. a connection to doing things in a cultural way using cultural know-how and community know-how. Um, part of the reason why I referred to, you know, um, my parents' um, example or experience with Wumpa and Moorlag is that as a young fellow, I, I observed how, um, how when, when tenants were uh, struggling with going, you know, paying rent, so forth and so on, the company didn't kick them out the door. It, wa it wasn't a transactional relationship. Or well, what I realised, it was a transformational relationship because people understood the, the, the cultural challenges. People understood the, the, um, the needs that the, the, that community placed and family placed on, on the individual. Um, and coming into New South Wales, into the land rights system, um, that type of sentiment, that type of practice, that type of ex expertise, that type of experience endures. Uh, and the examples that, that I'll cover aren't necessarily 
related to housing than solar, but the first one is. And that, that's in relation to uh, Toomala uh, Local Aboriginal Land Council. Um, now, traditionally, um, regardless of the, 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 the negative sort of media coverage um, that tends to portray Toomala as, as a dysfunctional community, the, the, the rental collection in Toomala is actually quite high and, and, and has been quite high for some time. Um, now, they've changed uh, management of their, of their properties in more recent time. Um, and the reason why I use the example is that um, the, the new housing managers um, and have employed two local people um, to, from the community to help tenants deal with any of the issues that they may have around um, repairs and maintenance, around whether or not they're struggling to, um, to pay rent, so forth and so on. And it's this connection of those two people in, in the community that, that underwrite why it's a successful service. The other example is, isn't a housing example. It's to do with Dark and John Land Council and their uh, relationship with Lend Lease and the redevelopment of the Gosford Hospital site. Now, Dark and John signed that MOU with, with Lend Lease because Lend Lease uh, were looking under the um, New South Wales um, procurement policy for uh, Indigenous procurement policy, it was looking for uh, partnerships with, with, the, with the local Aboriginal Land Council. It's a quite successful partnerships, uh, partnership because what it does is it recognises the need for um, uh, the, that then leads to be able to understand that when you're employing people, when you're, when, when you're employing uh, a, a group of people that, that have experienced the legacy of colonisation, uh, being conditioned a certain way because of that legacy, um, that you need uh, a, a level of understanding uh, and a bit of support around um, upskilling people to become electricians, become construction workers, uh, so forth and so on. And it's that link back to community that, that's made the, the relationship successful. The last one, um, the last example I'll use also is, is to do with uh, an Aboriginal employment uh, um, service called Yarnan. Uh, many of you will know Yarnan. It's located in Redfern. And they use a VTAC type approach to um, matching uh, um, you know, the, the right people to the right jobs. Uh, and it's not only about matching the right people, it's about looking out the community that that person comes from as well. Uh, and trying to identify where the risks or the barriers for people to be able to continue on and um, uh, maintain uh, gainful employment. But it's a, it's a sort of pastoral care type approach uh, as VTAC, as people would understand that, that, that the VTAC process is. And VTAC is a, is a successful um, example of how, uh, how services can be delivered in a way or how support can be delivered in a way that places community and culture front and centre to supporting the individual to um, access every opportunity that they're entitled to. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you.